Aloha Aquascaping World, this is Stephen Chong of the Tokyo Aquascaping Union. Today I'd like to talk about this Iwagumi layout that I designed at the Aquaflora Gallery in the Netherlands. Um, I think many of my audience might have already seen the streams that were on Facebook as well as the um, short video that Philippe Oliveira put online. Um, I'll leave some links in the description if you want to see more of the actual process of how the layout was designed. Uh, today I want to give you kind of more insight into my thoughts and my impressions when putting together the layout and what it is that I was trying to aim for. Uh, so I think that this is a rather unique Iwagumi design because it's not strictly Iwagumi. Um, I think it's kind of a fusion between Japanese Iwagumi and uh, the Giorama style or even a biotope type of mindset to making layouts. In fact, it might even be better described as the reverse. It's a Georama slash biotope style layout that uses uh, perspective and powerful dynamic elements um, and uses very much a lot of Fukada-san's techniques in terms of creating shadows to frame a scene, um, create a strong viewpoint, lead the eye to it, and use perspective to give a sense of distance. Um, those things are pri you know, those are the main characteristics of the layout. And then influence from Japanese Iwagumi is used in order to uh, dictate how composition works. In other words, it's a Japanese Iwagumi influenced Giorama style layout instead of the reverse. A Giorama influenced um, Iwagumi is, I think, less accurate in the description of how this layout actually works visually. Um, obviously, I use one very powerful uh, Oyaishi the main stone here, which is uh, very reminiscent of a Jap traditional Japanese Iwagumi. And I think some of the more relaxed or flatter stones around it are also, um, like, for instance, if you read Amanasan's book, placing a flat stone in front of uh, the, the father stone is a tr very traditional Japanese technique. Um, or you can have, like, steishi, uh, which means the throwaway stone, which is put to the side. Um, and supporting actors that, you know, work with the father stone. Those are all, you know, tenets of traditional Japanese Iwagumi, but I think here they're used more to inform um, how to put together you know, a very powerful and interesting um, Giorama aquascape, each, how to place each stone in an interesting way that's not boring. Um, technique and ideas behind traditional Japanese Iwagumi are used here, but Mostly in order to tell a story that is more within the long, more within the lines of like a georama um, way of thinking about how to put together the layout. I mean, the story for the aquascape. Um, for those who didn't watch the other videos um, or can't get it from the initial impression, I wanted to talk about um, the story of a fast, cold stream high up in the mountains. Japanese, we use the term joryu, which means uh, a river high, you know, the upstream, the, the, um, the waters higher up into the mountains, joryu, literally above flow. And what's characteristic of that type of environment, at least in you know, the Japanese Iwagumi um, way of thinking, is that if a stone is higher up in the mountain, then it has spent less time being worn down by the water. Whereas Karyu, or further down the stream, would be more like um, the layouts you see a Monosan do with the Hakai stone, or um, if you're in America, maybe you can buy Pahai from Taiwan or China. Um, in other words, those type of smoother river rocks, smooth, round, is kind of like a Karyu type of image. It's been pushed all the way down the mountain, and... Um, if it's fill, if it's surrounded completely by moss and hair grass, that's also kind of in that idea of you know the stones being in a mature place, having been pushed down by nature and surrounded by nature. Whereas this layout, um, instead, the stones are very harsh, jagged, rough. They are yet to be you know rolled down the mountain. In fact. High up in the mountain, they are influenced by the cold. Um, in fact, it gets so cold that rocks can crack. I was really happy when I found this stone because I thought that it would be very good at expressing my image. Um, I jammed in some other smaller ones around to give the impression of it um, 
you know, the bigger stone cracking. And I actually smashed this stone a little bit on this side to um, make, like, make it look like there were cracks. I tried to find more of those very angular, jagged stones, but um, honestly, one of the interesting characteristics of Frodo stone, which is um, the stone that this layout is made of, you know, Frodo from Adam's um, shop in Poland, is that there's a very big diversity in color and texture. So getting it all together and then, you know, within the limited stones that there were at Aquaflora, lots, but mostly larger stuff. Had to actually break down bigger stuff to get smaller stuff. Um, and it's not like they were um, putting together lots of Frodo just in expectation for me to come. It's a little bit different situation uh, from, for instance, the Iwagumi that scott -san put together at Green Aqua. You should definitely check that bit out as well. Um, where, you know, Adam, you know, put together a huge number of stones just for that execution. Um, picking from what there was, I had to find stones that I would, would fit together, color, texture, and so forth. And ultimately, I was looking for stones that could help put this image together. The image of... Um, High up in the mountain, cold stream, um, the Joryu setting where like stones crack because of the cold. Um, I also chose plants, uh, light colored plants, cool green plants that I figured would work with that type of se um, scene. You have the uh, Monte Carlo and HC in the very far background. These are kind of similar to, for instance, if you see elatine species or Glossostigma. Um, in the wild, they're a very light colored green plant that can grow in um, spring, way, spring waterways and uh, mountain puddles. <clears throat> or for instance, I end up picking Yunkis Ripens, which is another, you know, kind of wild looking river plant. Uh, this is very similar to the Potomagetan Gai that I chose for uh, my 2000 and eight, I sorry, my 2019 aquascape, Amanogawa. And in fact, um, I think that for people who are familiar with that layout, um, they can probably take a look at this one and see that you know there's a heavy influence um, from that layout to this layout. This layout is not really a Japanese theme, um, only the theme of a cold mountain stream. But the fact that you know I did a lot of study and research for the Amanogawa layout is what made this is a real comfort zone type of aquascape for me. Um, I knew that I would be able to choose details and choose different plant species and uh, themes that would work within um, work for that storyline because I had already done a lot of research on those types of environments for the sake of um, Amanogawa. And I thought that it would work really well with Frodo because I've always imagined Frodo as kind of a cold, um, cold mountainous type of stone. I'd have to do some more research to see if that's actually the case, but uh, you know, giving my description of how I feel about you know Kadu type of Iogumi versus Jodu, um, this isn't a downstream smooth stone aquascape. It's a um, high mountain cold. Um, cracked rocks and rough nature, like the, the sheer force of, like for instance, the power of snow melting up in the mountains, pushing through, um, carving through rock and, um, you know, making a very harsh angular type of scene. Um, and where, you know, there really can't be a whole lot of different stem plants and different, um, it's, these are, the type of image that I imagine, sorry, <laughs> the type of scene I am imagining is not one that can be choked full of different um, aquatic plants. This is not like a swamp in Florida that you see in one of Chris Lookhop's um, type of videos where stem plants and all sorts of fish species are choked together. Now this is rugged environment, um, often with very little mineral in the water where different species that can endure the cold flourish because of the lack of diversity and competition. Um, I also like to use, in the bottom, we, we, we see some uh, Monosolium tenera, which is something that we actually found in like the back end tank of one of um, 
green aquas nurseries it wasn't like you know sprouting everywhere but when i asked for this type of strange plant uh, one of the guys realized that they had some just like growing naturally um, so we decided to pick that up and there will actually be um, European willow moss found the exact same way kind of in the back end of a different nursery that's going to be planted in between the monosolium tenarium as highlights again these are kind of uh, very low maintenance plants that you could imagine in a very cold and rugged setting um, you know, eking out an existence between the rocks but in a very clear clean type of water which is why they can really <clears throat> do well in that setting uh, the fish for the aquascape will be the alabama shiners and i just imagine them going swoosh, like um making a line in and around this shadow area in the foreground i think that would look really great if you were trying to make this uh, into a type of contest photo type if you tried to take a photo of this similar to where you would do with a contest um, aquascape and um, I imagine that the back would be choc choked with HC and um, I'll have to like take photos or, um, I'll have to get photos from Philippe as the aquascape develops and give my input into how I'd like to see it further uh, matured but I think right now I want this to run off the edge of the paper to make the idea that the stream keeps flowing further back up. Maybe this is the exit point and it goes up and up and up and out. So maybe have HC grow all the way off the edge and even maybe bring in some of these plants, the uh, Neurophyllum uh, Guyana and Juncus Repens to be pl planted even back here. Initially, I only planted HC and Heliocalorus, Heliocalorus <laughs> mini hair grass, um, Heliocalorus parva um, as highlights in the background because I really wanted to, well, instinctually, um, I wanted to play off the idea of perspective and make this seem very far away. But in retrospect, I think that's a bit too much. Um, Maybe pushing the limits of perspective a little bit too much, and we don't really, Aquascape doesn't really need it. It's got more than enough sense of depth, even if we um, continue this line of plants. And what I don't really like is the fact that these plants just end here. Um, you kind of want some sort of continuation. So maybe even if we only play plant the Murophyllum Uganda a little bit on this end, and then maybe a little bit over here, I want the idea. Um, that this line is continuing into the background. Um, same with these stones. Well, you see, like, guys, uh, the way this works compositionally, it's kind of like a, a convex layout that frames the viewpoint, and the foreground has some strong lines that direct you towards the viewpoint as well. But um, this group of stones on the right, uh, the way it interacts with the background, I think is. Um, what really gives you the sense of perspective and also a sense of depth in this layout. Like if you cut off the aquascape here, it would still functionally work, but um, it's, a it's a rather boring aquascape at that point because uh, there's nowhere else to look except straight to the viewpoint. And I guess, you know, explore the middle area a bit, um, this darker world underneath the, the ledge. But when you have this side on the right, um, it feels like there's one more layer, one more dimension to the aquascape. Your eye can, uh, your eye knows that it has to go here, so it feels comfortable. But at the same time, there is a little bit of room to meander, explore. Especially this world on the right side makes you wonder about the depth of the aquascape, the depth of the world that you're looking at. And so you kind of, um, after seeing the initial father stone, maybe you like start to. Explore Explore some of the details in aquascape, but especially these right side stones um, and you know the chock full of nature. This is really the platform to show off plants, right? This is the place that's going to be more most green and full of plant life. And I think um, in the final, if Philippe adds some more white sand to make this secondary path even stronger, then I'll also add more interest and more curiosity, and the eye can follow these plants. Um, 
and this line of stones into the background. It's a natural continuation from here to here. Um, and I really liked how that gave this Iwagumi you know, an extra sense of dimension. Um, and that's kind of the that's kind of my breakdown into um, how this layout works, both from a composition standpoint, a story standpoint, um, as you know, a single piece of art. Um, it is a georama slash biotope influenced kind of aquascape. Um, you know, georama in terms of being a powerful, dynamic, and uh, perspective based aquascape. Um, biotope in terms of taking a strong thematic or direct from nature type of approach in order to in doing story building. It's influenced by Japanese Uagumi in terms of stone placement. Um, the story is a cold mountain stream, Joryu, up in the north. And I have these different um, visual elements in terms of guiding the eye towards the viewpoint and um, adding extra dimension and making sure that I also have a place to show off plants and picking a fish that I think will work with the story. Um, now I'd like to take some time to actually talk about the build itself and I think the most effective way to do that is actually just to work over Philippe Olivieria's um, video. You can check this out on the <clears throat> you can check this out on Philippe's channel. Um, definitely subscribe to him if you haven't. And um, so I'm just going to actually um, skip to different scenes of the video that he edited out and talk about what's going on here. At the very initial stage of the aquascape, um, I had put in a layer of styrofoam on the, on the bottom. I knew that I had to make the base as strong as possible in order to support that main father stone because guys, it is gigantic. And in fact, I think a lot of... Um, there were a lot of comments in Instagram and so forth about how the hell is this stone standing here? How the hell are you guys getting um, it to be put in place? I'm going to be talking about that. Um, from a personal standpoint, I actually don't think that this stone is too big of a deal in terms of placement. It does leave a very big impression when you take a look at it. But... Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I am okay. Looking at it again, I get how um, some people thought that this was kind of crazy, too bold, and we'll get more into the story of that. If some people who are more familiar with my other um, contest aquascapes, like my CIPS 2019 work, know that I've done even more ridiculous things with big stones um, in some of my other aquascapes. So I didn't personally feel uncomfortable, but that said, you know, putting in such a big stone in front of so many people does <laughs> leave one feeling nervous at times. And I had to make sure that I prepped well for it. Um, so at the very base, I put a layer of styrofoam because I wanted to have some very secure sto support stones. And I also wanted to um, have a cushion against the weight that was going to be put in place. Um, above the layer of styrofoam, so after that, I placed two stones. Um, see right. Yeah, so you can see me placing the initial stones here. Um, so these two stones are the real key to this aquascape. Um, they are the base. And it's interesting because um, this stone here on the left, I don't know if we can get a better shot of it here, but that stone on the left was actually initially my idea for the father stone of this aquascape. Um, it was the one of the big stones that I thought was appropriately sized, but working with it in the studio, it just felt too small. Um, one of the challenges of this aquascape was using the Frodo stones in this size aquarium, but getting enough height. Um, the thing is, I wanted to talk about stream right i wanted to express the idea of a riverway using photo but for that type of aquascape it really would be more ideal to have a 120 centimeter tank um, like i did for amanogawa because you have more length left to right to show the idea of a flow through the aquascape when you have um, only 90 centimeters 
and you have 50 centimeters of height to work with, and you know you're going to be in front of people. So you cannot just say, you cannot just um, take the aquascape to a low point and say, uh, well, you know, if I were to take a photo of this, I would lower the water level. This isn't that type of aquascape. It's not a contest work uh, that's just meant to show uh, good for a photo. It's going to be seen by people in front of a live audience, in fact, as we put it together. So I knew I had to deal with the height. Um, I actually was given six to seven hours of time to simulate the aquascape in the garage um, workshop area of Aquaflora. And I got to tell you guys, it was kind of a pressure doing this next to Fkata-san, um, doing the same for his woodscape at the same time, because yeah, the Malaysian, drift, uh, Malaysian driftwood that Fkata-san used was so cool and so um, nice impact. And actually, you know, much easier to work with, especially in aquascape with this kind of height. That's why initially when I saw the materials at Green Aqua, I also wanted to use it. Uh, but I realized that uh, Fukada-san probably also wanted to use it. But more importantly, you know, Fukada-san had done the hard work of putting together one of these Frodo Iwagumis at Green Aqua. Whereas I made kind of this... Um, I made a wood aquascape in a 60 centimeter tank over there. And uh, I, in past workshops, like when Ono-san and Fukara-san went to different sessions, one did stone, one did wood in order to give different perspective. So given all of that as background, I decided that I would take on the challenge of doing the Iwagumi aquascape um, using the stone. And I thought it would be a good idea anyway because um, Frodo is not a readily available material outside of Europe. It's definitely not a stone that I've ever seen in Japan. Um, Ono-san is trying to see if <laughs> he can get it brought in, but um, likely it's going to be very expensive given the shipping and so forth. I don't see myself buying a um, large set of contests for contest photo stones. And it's also, you know, I've always thought that it would probably be a very difficult stone to work with, not one that can work for a whole lot of different layout ideas. But um, I wanted, given that, you know, given all of that, I thought it would be a good idea to show my vision for this stone and get my idea for the way to make a layout from it done here at Aquaflora. Uh, so you can see me starting to piece it together. I did go through a, quite a bit of frustration because it's not nearly as easy to put this together without um, super glue or any type of um, you know, reinforcement, just uh, different rocks and you know, pure layout skills inside of a cardboard box. Um, but I kind of got an idea of what I wanted to do. And I knew that you know, despite you know, the weight and difficulty of putting this together um, without any adhesive, like when I got into the final aquascape, I would be able to bring it together. At this, when I got it to this point, without glue, I thought, ah, it'll probably work out. <laughs> it, it was a lot of pressure considering Fukara-san was right next to me and his like wood layout was like perfectly designed in the, in the box. Like, this is how it will look in the final form. Like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to eh, fudge my way through it any, at the end. Um, but um, you can see that I did choose this really huge stone to put in here and it was because of the height, because I couldn't figure out any other way to make good use of the um, 50 centimeters worth of height. And I thought that kind of having a stone like this that was a, um, a nod, you know, my nod to Japanese Iwagumi and being here kind of representing Japan in Europe, um, it would be good to do that anyway. Um, the stone that I initially chose as a father stone and one other, I actually ended up dropping um, the second daughter stone by accident. So this stone here on the right, um, I was figuring out what to do with it. Um, I accidentally dropped it and half of the bottom broke out and I realized, oh wow, that's even better. That's even better because um, this stone will naturally form a shadow and this is what I'm describing here in the video. Um, after the base of that stone broke out, it had kind of a cupped shape that I knew would um, form a shadow if it was placed like this. And um, 
give the sense of a, kind of a cave-ish area, kind of a drop-off. Like it could be used as a drop-off um, of a waterfall, which would make a lot of sense in the type of scenery that I was describing. And I realized that the father stone that I had stopped working with, um, one of the reasons I stopped working with it because there were just so many um, details, I thought it would be too noisy as a main um, attraction stone. But given its shape and given those extra details, I knew that if I placed these two together, they would, um, the details would give a huge sense of depth, but I would also get this beautiful shadow that I could use as a backdrop to do any kind of foreground work. Um, so I adjusted the height using the styrofoam board. Initially I had two, but reduced that to one. Um, on one supporting rock to keep them in place here. It didn't really matter though because I knew I was going to place that cracked angular stone in front um, to do the storytelling and draw the person into the layout. Uh, what we did though is we went ahead and super glued all three of these rocks to the piece of styrofoam um, to make sure that they wouldn't be able to move. And Guys, when you create the base of an aquascape, it's super important because it's going to be the foundation that everything else is built on. And it's going to be the stonework that is hardest to move if you move it at all. Um, this is a lesson I learned from Fukada-san when uh, initially training. He said, always, always, always focus a lot on the base because um, a strong base will be, the f it will be the literal and visual foundation of the rest of the aquascape. Like if you look at Longing from 2015, it looks like a wood aquascape, and it is, but the real secret to how that layout works is all in the stonework that's underneath the wood. And here too, the really important thing about uh, how this aquascape would be put together, especially given the size of that father stone that was going to be placed on top, um, you know, the building a very strong, reliable base um, was the real key to this aquascape. So you see me putting in that cracked stone and um, I slid in the other, this is a good detail, I slid in the other um, <coughs> cornerstones at this point because I knew it would be very difficult to get them in afterwards. Then you see me putting in the rest of the um, line stones on the right side. see here if we can get a good visual from the front so I start to put in the stones on the right um, and note too guys that these stones are also placed to make the shadow um, so that there's a dark shadow line going on to the right what that means is that these two are not um, very naturally well settled like the bright stones like on the left side um, obviously they're tilting back. When you, when you have a sloped aquascape, the stones that are bright, since they're leaning into the slope, they're actually much more physically stable. Whereas the shadow stones, which are leaning away from the natural slope of the aquascape, they're less stable. So you can prop them up with support stones and so forth, but they're not going to be as reliable as these guys. And so um, if they are the foundational base, the less reliable, less st stable stones, and there's going to be a huge father stone on top. Um, it means that the real secret to making all of them work uh, from a stability standpoint will be in back. Um, and what we did is, I don't know if there's a good shot here in this um, sequence video. Yeah, there probably isn't. But I went ahead and jammed <clears throat> so after putting these last initial stones into the right, I went ahead and jammed lava rock into every single crack and crevice in the back right. Um, literally, nothing could move because I took up all of the empty space. So, like, if you put your hand in here and you tried to push them back, <clears throat> um, you wouldn't be able to because I took up all the space in the back with um, lava stones. Very, very light lava stones, so hopefully Philippe will be able to take this to some trade shows and stuff. I'm not so sure about that, but if this aquascape never gets to move to any type of events, well, so be it. I still got to do what I wanted to do. Um, but we jam-packed the space with lava stone, um, super glued all of the stones together, 
um, super glued all of these rocks in the front to the lava stones and super glued all the lava stones to each other so that really nothing could move because we had to make the base absolutely unmovable. Uh, and of course they were super glued to the styrofoam as well. And those two base stones as well. Everything, um, there's probably like 40 or 50 super glue attachments just in the base. And then we get to this guy, um, putting it in. And it was so funny because after we, after the stone, stone was set, Fukara-san turned to me and was like, Steven, this is a lot Which means in English, Steven, uh, this is really overdoing it. <laughs> but I'm like, well, we're already here, man. It's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right, sensei. Um... And my tech, oh, here you can see all the lava rocks pushed into back. Um, and you can even see some of the super glue attachments. So <laughs> we got this one in. Um, I had Philippe pass me a few different slides of um, uh, more, more styrofoam. And this is a technique I actually developed for CIPS. Um, and I know I haven't gotten around to doing a video of that talking about that layout, I will. Um, but I did a really bold aquascape with a even less stable stone jutting out at a tough angle and then another wood structure sitting on top of that. So I knew that my idea was going to be extremely hard to do from a stability standpoint, especially without any assistance. Um, so for that aquascape, um, I developed this technique of taking pieces of styrofoam and shoving it in and around the father stone in order to hold it in place while it is super glued. So, let me see. I know Philippe has a really good shot of how we did that here in the video later on. So you see we have like three or four different pieces of styrofoam shoved into place, uh, holding the um, stone in place. Guys, this is a really good technique. Um, initially, I developed this with the idea that it was a good shortcut um, for an aquascape that was going to be done in limited time in a live setting. Um, I wouldn't have time to put in other supporting stones to hold it in place while the glue, um, glue dried. But after doing it once, I realized that this technique is a good technique in general. Because styrofoam, unlike things like bricks or stones that could be used to hold um, structures in place, they won't scratch the glass. So you can kind of shove them in anywhere you want. And uh, the styrofoam gets naturally destroyed in the process of being shoved, like it gets shaven away. It's okay because when you fill the tank, all the extra bits of foam and whatnot will float to the top and you can scoop them out. In the meantime, you can you know build this type of bold layout without worrying about scratching the glass using supporting material and kind of shoving it in and fitting it in wherever you want. Um, and it's really convenient. So uh, definitely keep big pieces of styrofoam like this when you're about to do hardscape or even just buy it if you need to. Uh, it's not that expensive. And um, <laughs> so when we got to this point, kind of the Facebook Live comments were blowing up. Um, what the hell? What are you doing, Steven? <laughs> the thing, or people who join halfway through the chat are like, why isn't that stone falling over? Um, it's not magic. It's not anti-gravity. Um, it's just lots and lots of super glue and, you know, good planning. Um, good uh, foresight into how this type of thing would be done. But um, I guess after you've done a lot of aquascapes where you have this type of bold element, it becomes... Like, for me, I was not, um, like, I was, I mean, I knew that I had to be careful, and I was extra, I knew that I had to be super focused when we were doing it, because screwing up would have big consequences, but I wasn't nervous about doing, uh, I wasn't nervous about doing it, I was actually pretty nonchalant, I was like, yeah, this is not that hard, this is something that we're going to be able to do, and um, be able to do pretty easily. I think in Philippe's video, what he responded to one of the commenters, I would never have something like this at my house because I'd be too nervous. I'm kind of over that. I'm kind of past that point. I'm not about to get nervous about something like this. Um, actually, 
this stone is but <laughs> this stone is so kind of out there um in the tac chat the north american group chat when we were talking about it hip even pointed out to me that this stone feels like it's you know it's totally anti-gravity it's not settled it's um it's really bending expectations especially like uh, in the initial uh, in the initial after the initial planting um you can see that there's still an empty space here and that's why um hit was pointing out to me that it didn't feel like uh, the, the rock was actually settled it was actually seated in place like this doesn't make sense visually and i actually agree with that uh, that is a good thing to point out and I noticed it the next morning, which is why in the final form, you'll see, um, unfortunately I didn't do this for the live event, but when I refilled the scape at Green Aqua, um, before we left, mm -hmm. before we filled up the tank, I went ahead and put in an extra stone here in order to connect the line and make the rock seem more settled, like it was sitting in place. And also, um, I felt like the stones that I initially put into the aquascape in this background area were just too small. This is really too much in terms of perspective. It's unbelievable compared to the ones to the right. So um, instead match them up with some bigger stones you can see that were elevated even higher in order to you know connect the line more cleanly and um, give a bit more sense of believability along with putting this stone in to stabilize. So, Going back to YouTube, the way we ended up continuing this layout. Um, after this father stone was in place, honestly, I did breathe a sigh of relief because I knew that the hard part was done. Um, as I, <laughs> I wasn't nervous, I wasn't scared about it, but I knew that this was the part where I had to be extra focused and it would be the most challenging part of doing the aquascape. Um, after that, we filled with lava rock um, into every crack and crevice, like little um, lava pebbles in order to you know finally stabilize the layout oh here you can see some of the <laughs> this reminds me of something um, you can see some of the other support <coughs> uh, photo stones that were placed in back I put these on top of the lava rock to make sure that there was weight on the lava rock um, the, the, none of the, the none of the lava would feel like floating none of it would um, be crushed under the weight of this father stone. Just a few extra Frodo in back here um, in order to for extra insurance. And um, this one, I wanted another big ish support stone to um, to be glued in back. And when I told Fukarasan, um, yeah, we're gonna need one more big stone. He was like, he he was envisioning that I wanted to put another big one like this. He was like, oh, no, please don't, Steven. You're, you're scaring me now. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I just meant another biggish support stone to glue it. He's like, oh, okay. You were starting to freak me out, man. <laughs> so even Fukada-san was getting a bit nervous by um, this process. And that was, um, that was when I knew that I had really pushed the limits on this. I was actually smiling a bit inside. Yeah, this is going to be great. Um, so after... <laughs> After shoving in the little bits of lava in order to fill the cracks and crevices, um, guys, the reason why we do this is we want to be able to lift the overall level of the aquascape without <clears throat> um, getting compaction. So underneath the aqua, aqua soil, there's um, those red lava pebbles with, um, raised as high as possible. Here in Japan, we tend to use pumice, which is readily available from garden shops. Either works, whatever floats your boat. Um, and then aqua soil was placed on top in order to get the planting media. Um, we put in the plants, and Philippe is really the master of uh, planting. Uh, he actually showed me and Fukarasan this technique of putting in plants into dry aqua soil. Um, as long as the roots are kept fairly wet, you know, they're going to be okay anyway. Uh, when you have dry aqua soil that you put the plants into, they, um, they naturally kind of fit and form around the plants more easily. So instead of, 
it takes less effort in order to get the plant to stay down. And then when you soak the tank too, there's actually less aqua soil that floats up, something I noticed. Um, when you wet the soil and then put in um, plants, what ha tends to happen is that the you have a wet layer on top and there's a dry layer underneath and some of the dry aquascape comes through. Um, but what I noticed doing this with Philippe was that when we put um, the plants into dry aqua soil um, and the plants, not, the water from the plants kind of wet the area around them naturally <clears throat> and the moisture kind of spread out evenly um, and then you know we did spraying alongside of it and I really didn't see a lot of aqua soil float up when we were filling the tank which is something that I thought was really impressive um, and this takes us to the end process of uh, planting and filling the tank to give us the final image. Um, overall, you know, this aquascape turned out even better than I imagined it. Um, I'm really happy that I was able to uh, demonstrate, you know, ca demonstrate characteristics of my style. Bold, dynamic, powerful, um, you know, strong lines, using shadow and compositional elements. Um, to lead up to a strong viewpoint, you know, my inheritance from Fukada-san, as well as um, the type of deep study of nature and deep storytelling that I tend to like to focus on, really expanding, expanding the depth of the story by bringing in ideas from Biotope, etc. And having all of that come together, you know, in one aquascape that we did live, you know, not something that I worked on for months and months and months in prep, prep work before putting together but something that we did in two days getting to showcase all of that together even with a bit of Japanese Iwagumi influence um, I just think that everything I wanted came together in this aquascape and I'm really proud of this work um, looking forward to hearing Ono-san's thoughts on it too because he said that he really wanted to talk about it um, when we got back yeah, given the situation, I don't think we're going to be having a TAU drinking party anytime soon. Um, unfortunate, because I really want to get some ideas from Fukada-san and Ono-san. We would, you know, we kind of want to get together and break down our different thoughts on the aquascapes that were made in our Europe trip. Um, and I thought that I would share those um, thoughts with you guys in a future video. Ah, the coronavirus situation is tough and... I would like you guys to understand that we planned this trip out a long time in advance and we went to Europe when the situation wasn't nearly as serious. Um, we flew out in the beginning of March, we came back mid-March. I actually skipped out on the trip to Lisbon because we needed to get back on going home. Um, our initial flight had been cancelled, we were rescheduled to a different route. We, I just needed to get Mia and Fukarasan back safe. Um, as this situation got more serious. Uh, Aquaflora was really responsible in taking a lot of precautions and making sure that the audience was safe, um, that we were safe. This, um, I think that everything um, came together very well and um, everyone acted very maturely. And uh, we made the best decisions possible given the change in situation. Um, I hope all of you guys are in a very safe place. I hope you all have the plants that you need because we are getting into the end stretch of preparing for IAPLC 2020. I actually just filled my tank yesterday. All the plants in, tank filled. Um, I've got two months to bring the husbandry up to place. But I do know that all of you are dealing with the same um, challenges that are coming forth from the stresses on our global supply chain. I hope that you guys are hunkered down in your rooms with the extra time to work on your scapes, but also not afraid of being able to get the right plants and fish that you need in order to complete your best layouts for the competitive season, which is coming, you know, crowned with ADA's 20th anniversary um, IAPLC contest. Uh, we're going to get through this, guys. We're going to get through this as an aquascaping community. We're going to get this we're going to get through this together as a human community. Um, we're going to get through this as one world. And uh, I really hope that uh, none of you guys are losing hope. I think that 
Our aquascapes are a little window back into nature, helps us de-stress from not being able to go out into nature as aquascapers. And um, yeah, you know, there's going to be more vids coming out from Europe, from Green Aqua, and I hope um, all of you guys tune in. Um, I made two aquascapes there. Scott Asan made two aquascapes there. The videos featuring them are going to be really interesting. Um, and I hope you guys tune in, and I hope those videos, you know, help fill the time and help uplift your spirits in these rough times. Um, I really appreciate my audience. Please like, subscribe if you like this content. Uh, follow me on Instagram as well. I'm going to be uploading more photos from our Europe trip. And um, stay safe, stay in a good place, and keep scaping. Take care.